No religion can offer the hope that Christians have. As we reflect on a God who meets all our needs as both Creator and Redeemer, the Apostle Paul states this in a convincing way when he writes to the Corinthians, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Here we see in one beautiful verse the joining of lights of both creation and redemption. Christians live as beacons to this hope in a dark and broken world that is in desperate need of the full-orbed answers offered only by the gospel. In the Hope of Ultimate Meaning, Knowing God the Creator and Redeemer teaching series, we will pursue knowledge of the one true God who gives us ultimate hope through His matchless work of both creation and redemption. Dr. Kel Beisner, who is the president and founder of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, is one of the voices who has helped me understand my role in this world from a stewardship of creation view more than almost anyone. And so it is my delight to tell you that he's here to speak for us today, and I'd like to invite him up to present now. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege to be before you today. Uh, one that I, I take with all seriousness. Um, I, I want to begin just by telling you very, very briefly what the Cornwall Alliance does. Uh, and I'll start off by doing it the way my wife does. She tells people, we're trying to save the planet from the people who are trying to save the planet. Um, <laughs> to put it a little bit less tongue-in-cheek, we exist to educate the public and policymakers on three things simultaneously and intertwined with each other. Biblical earth stewardship, economic development for the poor, and the gospel of Christ together with the biblical worldview, theology, and ethics that underlie that gospel. Uh, in terms of biblical earth stewardship, uh, we make Genesis 1.28 where God blesses man, uh, male and female, and says to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the, the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything that moves on the face of the earth. We take that as our starting point and we ask, what does this dominion mean? And to state it very briefly at this point, this would be that since we're made in God's image, our dominion should reflect his. He started with nothing and made everything. He started with darkness and made light. He started with disorder, chaos, and made order. He made more and more order out of less and less order. He made life out of death and great abundance and variety of life. So our dominion over the earth should reflect that. So we summarize it as saying that we should be seeking to enhance the fruitfulness and the, the, the uh, beauty and the uh, safety of the earth to the glory of God and to the benefit of our neighbors so that we're addressing the two great commandments to love God and to love neighbor. In terms of economic development for the poor, we identify five social institutions that we think are absolutely indispensable. Uh, those are uh, private property rights, free trade, entrepreneurship, and uh, limited government and the rule of law. And then in addition to those five social institutions, there's also the necessity of access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy. Because as we all learned back in grade school, energy is the capacity to do work. And in order to make food and clothing and shelter and everything else that human health and longevity depend on, we must do lots of work. The more energy you have available, the more work you can do. So these things are necessary to lifting and keeping whole societies out of poverty. And then the gospel of Christ, of course, is this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And as we trust in him, 
our sins are forgiven. We are given his righteousness and we are reconciled to the holy God despite our being sinners. So these are the, the things that, uh, that most drive us. And uh, I've been privileged to lead the Cornwall Alliance now since our founding in 2005. My topic this morning is the challenge of understanding and responding to climate change, combining biblical worldview, theology, and ethics with science, economics, and politics. And I'm going to begin with uh, looking at some foundational principles that we get from Scripture in terms of worldview. In Genesis 1.1, of course, and, and 31, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw all that he had made, after all the rest of the chapter, right? And behold, it was very good. Now, I'm going to pose some questions for you. I'm not going to answer them immediately, but I'm going to pose these questions. What does this imply about Earth's climate system? What does this imply about Earth's climate system? And second, is that climate system more likely, granted that God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good, is that climate system more likely to be robust, resilient, and self-correcting, or prone to, be, prone to catastrophic results from relatively minor perturbations? Those are questions that we will seek to answer during this talk. There is more to our foundation. The Lord said to himself, we read this in Genesis 8, 21 through 22, following the flood. The Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Again, some questions. Who controls Earth's climate and weather? And what has he promised to himself regarding the cycles on which life depends? Now again, there's more to our foundation here. In Genesis 9, 9 through 11, God says, now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with every living creature. And all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. And another question. Is catastrophic sea level rise? Not minor, we can adapt to it over time, but is catastrophic sea level rise due to man-made global warming, likely when God has promised never again to destroy the earth with a flood? Just pose those questions to you. Next, we go to the New Testament. And we read that Jesus, one day, was with the disciples in, the bo in a boat. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the waves, the sea, obey him? Mark 4. So the question, who controls the wind and the waves? With those things behind us, I have another question for us. What, what's really behind the climate change catastrophist narrative. 
And here I'm going to get at what I believe is the root of all climate change fears. In Jeremiah 5, verses 21 through 25, we read this. God speaking. Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble in my presence? For I have placed the sand as a boundary for the sea, an eternal decree, so it cannot cross over it. Though the waves toss, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot cross over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away. That is the spring rain and the later rain and the harvests that depend on them. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have withheld good from you. What is the real root of fears of environmental devastation? It's the real root of all of our fears, isn't it? It's the lack of the fear of the Lord. It's the lack of the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. It's also the lack of the fear of the Lord that should motivate us to obedient life. And when we, when we slide into disobedience, individually and as whole societies, we place ourselves under the judgment of God. He withholds the rains or he sends devastating rains. These things are not just natural phenomena. God is in control. But then we have another question that we need to ask. Does this, does this imply that there is no human responsibility Let's take a closer look. God created man in his own image. We read in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. In the image of God, he created them. Male and, or him rather. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God intends human dominion over the earth to be complete. Nothing on the land, nothing in the sea, nothing in the sky is to be excluded. And where there is dominion other than on the part of God himself, there is also accountability, responsibility. That's what makes us stewards, not sovereigns. further about our human responsibility. We read in Genesis 2, 15, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And God said in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over, well, everything in it, right? So, human responsibility comes with this instruction for us to exercise dominion. So when some people accuse evangelical Christians or Christians in general of not caring about climate change, because after all, God is in control. That's not our reasoning at all. In fact, it's not true that we don't care about climate change. We do, but we care to understand it truthfully and to respond to it in a properly stewardly way. Um, further, oops, about human responsibility. We read in Proverbs 24, 
I passed by the field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense, and behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. When I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. (laughs) Then your poverty will come as a robber and your want like an armed man. We are responsible. We cannot just turn our backs and and think that everything's just going to be fine regardless of what we do. Now let's begin to look more closely specifically at climate change. And I'm going to start off with what might be a shocking statement to many of you. It's a statement by Dr. David Legates. He is a retired professor of climatology at the University of Delaware, Uh, one of the earliest people in America to earn his PhD in climatology, extremely widely published in refereed journals, and he is now the Director of of Research and Education for the Cornwall Alliance. He's been a senior fellow of ours since almost when we began. And Dr. Legate says, it's not about the science, and it never was. So let me begin with a little bit of background on how all of this got started historically. David sketches all this out very well in a long chapter for a forthcoming book that Cornwall Alliance has put together that Regnery is to release later this year called Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism. There's this from Maurice Strong. Maurice Strong was the Secretary General of the UN Conference on the Human Environment. He was the first Executive Director of the UN Environment Program, and he was Foundation Director of the World Economic Forum. And in 1992, he discussed the plot of a book that he intended to write, and he said this, What if a small group of world leaders were to conclude that the principal risk to the earth comes from the actions of rich countries? And if the world is to survive, those rich countries would have to sign an agreement reducing their impact on the environment. Will they do it? The group's conclusion is no, the rich countries won't do it. They won't change. So in order to save the planet, the group decides isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? This group of world leaders form a secret society to bring about an economic collapse. That's the, uh, that's the words of one of the most important shapers of this entire movement. Further, Further evidence that it's not about the science, and it never was. Dr. Otmar Edenhofer was a co-chair of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in 2010, in the lead up to the Cancun Global Climate Summit, he said this. The climate summit in Cancun, you have to remember, this is an insider talking. This is one of the ones who support this stuff. Edenhofer said, the climate summit in Cancun at the end of the month is not a climate conference, but one of the largest economic conferences since the Second World War. Developed countries have basically expropriated the atmosphere of the world community, but one must say clearly that we redistribute, de facto, the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore, with problems such as deforestation or the ozone hole. That's the inside scoop. And again, it's not about the science, and it never was. Christiana Figueres was the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change from 2010 to 2016. And at a news conference in 2015, looking forward to the Paris Climate Summit, she said this, This is the first time in the history of mankind that we are setting ourselves the task of intentionally, within a defined period of time, 
to change the economic development model that has been reigning for at least 150 years since the Industrial Revolution. Now, if you know anything at all about economic history, you know that that model has been what we call capitalism or free, uh, free market economics. The alternative to that is socialism, which is no great surprise because her father, Jose Figueres Ferrer, was president of Costa Rica from 1953 to 58 and was a self-described farmer socialist with the National Liberation Party who led, quote, in his words, a deeper and more human revolution than that of Cuba while nationalizing the banking industry. This is the background of, of the chairwoman of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Once more, it's not, it's not about the science and it never was. There is a newly published book called The Grip of Culture, The Social Psychology of Climate Change Catastrophism by Andy West. This book is built out of the data from scores and scores of public opinion polls all around the world over the last roughly 30 years. It's a very, very amazing book. Um, about 400 and some pages long, and I read through the whole thing. Uh, and he says that the dominant narrative, namely that global climate catastrophe is certain within decades if we feel to take drastic action, is indeed sponsored by a culture and not by mainstream science. The IPCC's assessment reports do not support such a claim at all. Isn't that interesting? You've always been told, well, the IPCC says climate change is real. It's man-made. It's going to be devastating. We need to spend trillions of dollars completely revamping the entire global energy system in order to fight climate change. You will not find that in the IPCC's scientific assessment reports. The catastrophe narrative, West goes on to say, is in essence a fairy tale. It is not supported by mainstream science and owes its success only to emotive engagement. It convinces irrationally rather than rationally. Now, there's a lot more that I could tell you about West's book. I, I won't because time forbids, but, but my goodness, I would encourage you to read this. And actually, you can read it for free in a PDF on the website of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. That's thegwpf.org. All right, now... We come to an evangelical writing about these things. This is Kyle Mayard Schapp, who is uh, vice president of the Evangelical Environmental Network, and he was a founder of the Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. And in his book, uh, Following Jesus in a Warming World, he says, anywhere from 90 to 100% of climate scientists agree that the climate is warming at an alarming rate. The IPCC 2018 special report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees C, says, and it was important that I identify that document for you, he didn't say it in exactly those words, if we do not cut CO2 emissions in half by 2030, we will already begin to see catastrophic impacts by 2030. That's a quote from his book. But the IPCC report never says that. The words catastrophe and catastrophic appear 12 times in its 632 pages. I counted them. It's so nice to have digital search, <laughs> right? Eight of those are in the source titles of sources that the report uses. Two are about insurance related to catastrophes that are not dependent on climate change. Two are related to worst case scenarios that even the IPCC says are implausible. So it never calls any of this likely to happen. Okay, now, under the Obama administration, Dr. Stephen Koonin, a physicist, was undersecretary for science at the Department of Energy, and uh, in an annual lecture for the Global Warming Policy Foundation, uh, in 2021, Kunin said this, 
you don't find the words existential threat, climate catastrophe, climate disaster at all in the IPCC's sixth assessment report. You find the words climate crisis exactly once, and that's not a scientific finding, but it is in reference to the way in which the media have ramped up their coverage. So never again buy the notion that the IPCC supports catastrophic, uh, catastrophic or catastrophist narrative about climate change. It just doesn't. It's not in there. Okay, but... What about the science? Now, I have to preface this by saying this. I am not a trained scientist, right? Um, uh, much of physics and chemistry and whatnot like that just goes right straight over my head. I cannot do differential equations, right? But I can tell you this. Having read over 60 books on the science of climate change and many thousands of articles on it, uh, I have done far more work studying this, the science of climate change, than I did for my PhD, which was in history, not in, in any of the sciences. So I think that I do understand a wee bit about it, and in fact, one of Cornwall Alliance's board members and a uh, senior fellow of the Cornwall Alliance, Dr. Roy Spencer, who is a principal research scientist in climate science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, said to me about a decade ago, Cal, you know all the arguments pro and con about climate change better than any climate scientist I know. We all study our little narrow pieces of the pie. You study all the way across, okay? So I, I do think that though I am not a scientist, I have a pretty sound understanding of these things. So I'm going to begin now talking about the science. Oops, that was a mistake. There we go. By quoting for you from Dr. Judith Curry, Dr. Curry is a former professor and chair uh, in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech University. She's one of the most highly regarded climate scientists in the world. And she, uh, she wrote a book that just came out in June called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. And here's what she says on page six. Here are the incontrovertible facts about global warming. One, average global surface temperatures have overall increased since about 1860. Two, CO2 has infrared emission spectra and thus acts to warm the planet. Three, humans have been adding CO2 to the atmosphere via emissions from burning fossil fuels. Nobody contests those, including any climate change skeptic I know, and I know pretty much all of them all over the world. There is no significant disagreement in the scientific community on these points. However, these three facts, either individually or collectively, do not tell us much about the most consequential issues associated with climate change. And those are, she lists four, one, whether and to what extent CO2 and other human-caused emissions have dominated over natural climate variability as the cause of recent warming. There is no scientific agreement, uh, agreement on that. Two, how much the climate can be expected to change over the 21st century. Again, no scientific agreement about that. Three, whether warming is dangerous. <laughs> Notice, that doesn't even say whether it's catastrophic, whether it's an existential threat. There's not even scientific agreement over whether it's dangerous. And fourth, whether radically reducing CO2 emissions will improve human well-being in the 21st century. No scientific agreement on those things. Anybody who tells you otherwise is a propagandist, not a scientist, not even an impartial reporter. A little further about the science. Um, all of our predictions of future global temperature and of the consequences of that in terms of uh, weather events, alleged increased frequency of extreme weather events like hurricanes, floods, droughts, tornadoes, uh, heat waves, cold snaps, and so on. All of the predictions about that sort of thing depend on climate models, computer models of how the climate works. Let me tell you this first. 
The climate system is probably the most complex system mankind has ever studied with the exception of DNA and the human brain. There are thousands and thousands of factors that feed into the climate system. All of them react and interreact to and with each other. So the whole thing is an incredibly complex thing. So anytime somebody says, as does uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's an evangelical climate scientist, though she's actually a professor in the Department of Political Science of, at her university, uh, which is a telling uh, matter, uh, when Heho tells you, well, it's just basic physics. When you add CO2 to the atmosphere, since it absorbs heat moving out from the surface towards space and sends some of it back toward the surface, it's basic physics that you're going to have a warmer world. She's right, it is basic physics. But it's also basic physics that when you drop a rock and a feather from the same height, they'll hit the ground at the same moment. Unless, of course, they're in air. In which case, the rock plummets and the feather kind of wafts down like this. And if it's windy, the feather might blow up into a tree and get stuck and never come down, right? The world is a whole lot more complicated place than just basic physics. So anybody who tells you, well, it's basic physics, you know immediately that that person, even if she has a PhD in, in atmospheric physics or atmospheric science like Catherine Hayhoe, you know immediately she either doesn't know her science or she's fudging. So, what about these computer models? Well, they are the sole, fears of, uh, sole basis of fears of catastrophic man-made warming. How do they compare with real-world observations? The chart that you see there in this slide shows, uh, and it's ironically titled by Roy Spencer, who put it together years ago, over 95% of climate models agree the observations must be wrong. <laughs> now, uh, just for a moment, let me tell you a wee bit about science and scientific method. Uh, the late Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman has a very famous video clip that you can find easily online anywhere about what he calls the key to science. He says, when we try to figure out a, a, a law of nature, how something in the real, in the, in the real world works, First we guess, then on the basis of that guess, we make predictions of what we should see out in the real world if our guess is right. Then we make observations. We, we do experiments in the laboratory, we go outside, we look at things, we make observations. He says, if the observations contradict the predictions, then the guess is wrong. It doesn't matter how smart you are, or how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't matter how many people agree with you, or anything else, if the observations contradict the predictions, your guess is wrong. That's scientific method. Now what we see in terms of the models is that 95% of them over-predict global warming in response to added CO2 in the atmosphere. And in fact, they overpredict it rather, <laughs> rather uh, seriously. Uh, Spencer's graph, that particular one, came out uh, almost a decade ago. Is that still the case? Well, um, here we have uh, another graph. This is um, from John Christie, also at the University of Alabama. He and Spencer, by the way, are NASA award-winning climate scientists. The overwhelming majority of computer climate models predict two, three, or even four times as much warming as actually observed from 1979 to the present, the only period for which we have accurate representative global temperature measurements, which are from satellites. And those are what uh, Spencer and Christie together manage for NASA. The most recent models, CMIP-6, that's the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, sixth generation, the most recent models are worse than the precursors. So the models are still wrong. If they're wrong, then they provide no rational basis for any fears or any predictions about future temperature. And therefore, they also provide no rational basis for any policy in response to predicted warming. Um, 
you might want to know where you can learn more. I mentioned this book already, Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism. Dr. Ella Gates and I edited this. We've got 16 chapters by 16 different authors, some of the world's top climate scientists and energy economists and energy engineers have contributed to this book. I think it's going to be really, really helpful in the debate. So Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism, due out from Regnery later this year. All right. Now, the question. Is man-made climate change an existential threat to humanity? Dr. Bjorn Lomborg, who's the president of the Copenhagen Consensus and the author of the very fascinating book, The Skeptical Environmentalist, uh, he used to be a catastrophist and then he, he got angered by the work of Dr. Julian Simon, which showed that all sorts of environmentalist claims were false. And he said, well, I'm a, sta a statistician. I can disprove all of this. And he set out to do that, and instead he got converted when he actually looked at the, the hard data, and he wrote this book, The Skept Skeptical Environmentalist. Well, he's written much since then. But Dr. Lomborg takes for granted everything that the IPCC says about human-made global warming. He just accepts that. And then he says, all right, but what will it, what will it do, actually do to the world? And he gives answers to that, and according to their own data, no big problems. Well, he points this out from the uh, 2018 special uh, report from the IPCC called Impacts of 1.5 Degrees C of Global Warming on Natural and Human Systems. Uh, that was actually a, a chapter title, but the whole report was called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius. Under, this is quoting the IPCC here, under the no policy baseline scenario, that is, in other words, if we just let it rip, we don't do anything to try to slow down global warming. And by the way, no countries in the world at this point are planning on doing that. I, I think that's rather sad. I don't think there's any point in our trying to do anything to slow global warming, but all right, let's just take the IPCC. Under the baseline scenario, we let her rip. Global average temperature will rise by about 3.66 degrees Celsius by 2100, resulting in a global gross domestic product loss of 2.6%. 2.6%. Now, I ask you, is a loss of 2.6% of global gross domestic product, is that an existential threat? I, I would think that a loss of 80% of GDP for the globe, that would be perhaps an existential threat, but 2.6%? Goodness gracious, I don't think so. But the case is even, even much, much better than that. <laughs> because the IPCC predicts that 2.6% loss, not from today's global gross domestic product, but from global GDP in the year 2100. Well, you have to ask, what will that be? The best estimate of that is that it will probably be something in the range of 8.89 times what it is today, or would be that, if there were no damages from global warming. But according to the IPCC, we'll lose 2.6% of that. Okay, so the result is that it will be only 8.66 times as much as what it is today. Is it an existential threat for humanity, for global gross domestic product per capita to be only 8.66 times what it is today instead of 8.89 times? I don't think so. But that's the IPCC's figuring. Right? So, no, it is not an existential threat. All right, should we nonetheless do all that we can to mitigate, prevent, reduce climate change, global warming? I've just shown you one way of answering that question. Hey, is it worth trillions of dollars to try to save 2.6% uh, of global gross domestic product in 2100? Here's another way of approaching it. This comes from an analysis of the Paris Climate Agreement. Assuming everything that the, the, the supporters of the Paris Climate Agreement said about what would be the effect on global average temperature in the year 2100 
of complete implementation of all the commitments by all the countries in the world under the Paris Agreement, which, by the way, will not happen, but even assuming that you would get that, what does the Paris Climate Agreement support say will be the result in global average temperature? It will be a reduction of global average temperature of approximately three-tenths of one degree Fahrenheit. That's pretty much at the margin of error in our ability to measure global average temperature by our satellites. And it has absolutely no effect on any ecosystem or on human well-being. But, again, assuming the Paris Climate Agreement's own data, own theories as to what it will cost to achieve this, and this was run out by Bjorn Lomborg taking their own figures, the cost would be anywhere from uh, one to two trillion dollars per year, every year from 2030 to 2100. That's 40, pardon me, that's 70 to 140 trillion dollars to reduce global average temperature in the year 2100 by three-tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. That's 23.3 to 46.6 trillion dollars per tenth of a degree. And it just, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll sound political here for a moment. It doesn't surprise me that the, the author of the book, The Art of the Deal, thought that was a bad deal and took the United States out of the Paris Agreement. And sadly, his successor has put us back in it. Well, that's according to the Paris Climate Agreement itself. Should we, again, should we do all we can to reduce climate change or global warming? William Nordhaus, Nobel Prize winning economist, won the Nobel, Nobel Prize for his work on the economics of climate policy and energy policy, uh, said, look, you have to look not only at damage that can be foreseen, predicted, always fallibly, but that's okay. We're always fallible in predictions about the future. You know, Yogi Berra was right. Prediction's always tough, especially about the future. Um, we have to look, we have to look uh, not only at the damage that the warming can do, but also at the damage that our policies meant to try to slow the warming can do. And if we balance those out, if we, if we consider both of those, then what we find is that the lowest combined cost of damage from warming plus damage from policy happens when we aim for not 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature from today to 2100, but rather at a target of 3.5 degrees Celsius. Now that, by the way, is far above what is likely even if we were to do nothing about it. How do I know that? Because since 1979, when we've had reliable satellite-based uh, data on global average temperature, global average temperature has risen at a rate of 0.13 degrees Celsius per decade. We don't have enough decades left to get 3.66 degrees Celsius increase in global average temperature by the end of 2100. It's not going to happen. But if we give them the benefit of the doubt, Nordhaus says that's what we should conclude. All right. Around the world, roughly, roughly 4 billion people and that's definitely a rough figure, it changes all the time, have almost no access to electricity. About 700 million have zero access to electricity. For these roughly 4 billion people, the most common energy sources, and they're used only for cooking and a little bit of heating, are wood and dried dung. The average sub-Saharan African woman spends six to eight hours a day doing nothing but gathering wood and dried dung to cook 
the family's food and to heat the family's hut during the cold periods of the year. That's causing awful deforestation, but it's also causing, according to the World Health Organization, some three to four million premature deaths every year, mostly among women and young children, because of the, the uh, toxic fumes of burning that wood inside huts or just outside the door of the hut and exposing the people to breathing the smoke from that stuff, right? That's the primitive, en uh, primitive energy system seen in the left three pictures in, in this uh, combined slide here. What the developing world desperately needs is to replace that primitive energy system with a modern energy system where they get electricity from large-scale electric generating plants delivered through large-scale grids in order to replace that filthy and very, very low usefulness, if I may put it that way, very, very uh, almost useless energy from wood and dried dung. They need that and they need it desperately. But the problem is that the movement to push us to fight global warming by reducing our use of fossil fuels and increasing our use of wind and solar is a movement that will slow that replacement of the primitive energy system with the modern energy system. It will slow, stop, or reverse economic development all over the world, trapping people in long-term poverty. It is also a movement, as you've already seen from some of the quotations that I gave you earlier, that intends to replace free market capitalist economic order with socialist centrally planned government run economies. If anybody knows anything about the history of economics, he knows that that is the path to poverty. The only economic system that has a track, rec a track record of lifting and keeping whole societies out of poverty, not isolated individuals here, you know, the, the apparatchiks of the Communist Party, they get to rise out of poverty, but no, the only system that has a record of lifting and keeping whole societies out of poverty is capitalism. And that is a system that depends, as I mentioned at the start, on private property rights, entrepreneurship, free trade, limited government, and the rule of law. The climate change movement is determined to demolish all of those. Also, the only way that large societies have grown and stayed out of poverty is by having abundant, affordable, reliable energy. And today, around the world, roughly 85% of all the energy that we use comes from fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, more properly called hydrocarbons, because fossils probably are not actually the origin of most of these. Uh, coal, probably yes. Oil, most likely not. Natural gas, surely not. But um, the, the climate alarmist movement wants us to abandon hydrocarbon fuels. Essentially, 85% of all of our energy. Well, um, I'm going to uh, quickly show you this slide. I've discussed these matters in three of my own books, Prosperity and Poverty, The Compassionate Use of Resources in a World of Scarcity. This is a general introduction to economics from a biblical worldview perspective. The second is Prospects for Growth, a Biblical View of Population Resources in the Future. It applies the lessons of the first to the environment and, and resources uh, issues. And then the third is called Is Capitalism Bad for the Environment? And it compares the track records of capitalist and socialist countries, and it also answers the various arguments that say that capitalism does promote environmental destruction. The opposite is actually the case and the quickest and easiest way that I can, and, uh, that I can uh, give you an argument for that is to say, uh, I just ask you, uh, do you have graffiti on your bathroom wall at home? But you see it on bathroom walls in public all the time, don't you? Why? Because at home, your bathroom wall belongs to you. And what belongs to you, you have an incentive to take care of. 
What belongs to nobody, nobody has an incentive to take care of. So the more there is private property, the better things get taken care of. By the way, you can apply this to the whole wildfire issue. Wildfires are most rampant on publicly owned lands. On privately owned lands, they're practically non-existent. Why? Because private owners have a good incentive to take care of what they own. And the, the government does not have much incentive to take care of forests. All right, so what the globalist climate alarmists want instead is an economic order characterized by government control of land. There is the 30 by 30 project that is uh, being pushed right now by the, you know, the uh, Biden administration. Major restrictions on business, government managed trade, global government, and technocracy rule by experts rather than democracy. And they want energy from wind and solar that is by comparison with uh, coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear, uh, scarce, expensive, and unreliable. After all, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, and there is a difference in density between wind and solar on the one hand and coal, oil, and natural gas on the other. Now, energy density is an important concept. Uh, power density is even more important. Energy is a quantity measure. Power is a rate measure. And the density of energy in the source from which you try to refine and deliver energy to your useful products, right? Uh, the density of the energy source is critical to how much it costs and how much environmental harm is done in the process of mining, refining, and delivering the power from that energy to end users. The lower the original density is, the greater the costs and the greater the environmental harm. The higher the original density is, the lower the costs and the lower the environmental harm in using them. Well. We are told now that we need to reach a point of so-called net zero emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in the attempt to fight global warming, right? And that would mean the amount that we're adding to the atmosphere is equaled by the amount that we take out of the atmosphere, and we can achieve that either by adding less and less or by taking out more and more or by some sort of a combination of the two of those. Net zero now is the mantra in the, in the movement, right? Is there a road to net zero? Not if you're paying any attention at all to power density. Uh, here, is, here are a couple of different graphs comparing the median power densities of fossil fuel and nuclear generation with renewable electricity generation. Now notice uh, natural gas, nuclear, and oil in the blue bars of the upper graph there. Natural gas, nuclear, oil, and coal, very high energy density. The, the bars for solar, geothermal, wind, hydro, and biomass are so small that you can't see them on the same scale. So if you increase their scale, you, you get the green bars above there. But those green bars are actually the same as the practically invisible green bars just below them. That's the comparison. Or farther down there, uh, the second figure, you have the power density again of various energy sources, have ethanol at 0 0.1, wind at 1, solar at 10, oil stripper well at 27, uh, a multi-well natural gas pad at 1,000 plus, uh, nuclear at 2,000 plus, right? If you're paying attention to power density issues at all, no, there is no path to net zero. Um, here's another way of illustrating that. Uh, I'll just point you to the graph on the right there. This is a graph of the amount of land necessary to produce the equivalent of the energy released by the South Texas nuclear power plant, right? And if you look really, really carefully in the bottom part of that black and white graph there, you can see a little teeny tiny black dot uh, by the uh, 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 
let's see, Bay City, right? That black dot is the land for the South Texas nuclear plant to produce its energy. The bigger circles out from there are the amount of land necessary to produce the same amount of energy from the other sources like corn ethanol, uh, the, uh, a natural gas well, a, a biomass-fueled power plant, wind, solar PV, and so on. <laughs> here, here we go. Here's, here's yet another way of looking at it. If we wanted to get all of America's current electricity needs from wind, how much land would we have to cover? Now, this is one calculation. Uh, and the answer, this is from Robert Bryce in his book, uh, Power uh, Hungry, I think. I've read five or six of his books. I'm not sure at this point which one this came from. But um, you would need the land equivalent to two Californias to get America's electricity right now. Now, if you wanted to electrify all of our vehicle fleet in addition, that would take far more electricity than the electricity we currently use because gasoline and diesel pack far more energy in per pound or ton per uh, uh, cubic foot of space used than do wind and solar. So you would have to cover far more of our land. One study out of Harvard said that in order to get, and this actually disagrees with Bryce, it's, it, Bryce is optimistic compared with this, a Harvard study about three years ago said to get all of our current electricity from wind, you'd have to cover the entire U.S. Uh, contiguous 48 states from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River with wind, uh, wind turbines. If you wanted then to add an elect enough electricity to provide all of our vehicle fleet, you would have to cover the rest of the 48 states with wind turbines. That, of course, is just crazy especially for anybody who claims to be an environmentalist. I mean, these things are ugly as hell. Pardon my French. And Peter, I know that you love the French language, and that's not actually a word in French. But uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's just awful to, to see these things around the world. Um, what we're being asked is to sacrifice human well-being to an ideology, an ideology that is based actually in anti-humanism, right? Because it wants to see fewer people around the world. Um, there is, in fact, a near perfect co a correlation between fossil fuel use and human life expectancy. That's illustrated in this graph, that I've, or these two graphs. One is of life expectancy from 1800 to 2021, the other is of global fossil fuel consumption. And you will notice that they go up right step by step with each other because energy is so important to human well-being. <coughs> um, let's see. We can also uh, look at, all right, hmm, just taking a moment here. Um, all right. Okay, so... Much of the climate alarmist movement tells us that as the world warms, we will have more frequent and more severe uh, extreme weather events, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, heat waves, cold snaps, and so on, right? Now, in fact, the actual historical data tell us that there has been zero increase in the frequency or intensity of any extreme weather events over the period during which uh, global warming has been measurable. None at all. And there are actually some very good reasons in terms of atmospheric and oceanic physics why some of these should actually diminish with a warming world. Because essentially the climate system is a, a heat movement, movement system. It moves heat from where it's more intense to where it's less intense, from the equators toward the poles. And according to climate change physics, driven by greenhouse gases, warming happens more toward the poles than toward the equator, which means that there's less difference between the two, 
and therefore there is less need for the various mechanisms that move heat from the equator to the poles and transfer from cold from the poles toward the equator. So you should actually be able to predict a slight decrease in these things. And in fact, for hurricanes, that is observable over about the last 60 years or so. But so slightly that it's not really worth argumentation, right? But we are told that we're going to see more and more climate-related disasters if we don't fight global warming. Well, over the past hundred years, human mortality because of weather disasters, extreme weather events, has fallen by over 98%. Over 98%. There has been no measurable decline in the frequency or intensity of weather disasters. Why has human mortality fallen so much? Because the advanced economies driven by massive amounts of affordable, reliable energy have enabled us to protect ourselves. Poverty is a far greater threat to human life and health than anything related to weather and climate. If you have income equivalent to the bottom tenth of Americans, you can thrive in any climate from the Arctic Circle to the Sahara Desert to the Brazilian rainforest. If your income is the equivalent of a couple of dollars a day, you can't thrive in the best tropical paradise. At the very same time that we've watched atmospheric CO2 rise significantly, that's on the graph that's in front of you there, we've seen mortality due to weather risks plummet. And that's because this abundant energy has helped us to overcome poverty. Let's see. All right. Now, we're being urged to reduce our CO2 emissions to fight global warming. So is CO2 a foe or is it a friend? Well, first of all, long term, assuming the conventional ge geological theories, right, uh, which underlie all of the scientists who are warning about global warming, right, and the non-scientists too. But if you assume their geological theories of uh, an Earth that's been around for billions of years, through that geologic history, there has been no statistically significant correlation between carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere and global average temperature. That doesn't mean that CO2 isn't an infrared absorbing gas and that it doesn't make the, 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 the globe warmer than, an other, than it otherwise would be when we add more CO2 to the atmosphere. It doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is that other factors far outweigh CO2. CO2 is not a control knob for uh, global average temperature. Let me give you five facts about CO2. First of all, it's non-toxic at 30 times the present atmospheric concentration of roughly 420 parts per million. Second, it's not the global temperature control knob. It mostly follows changes in temperature. It doesn't lead them. That's because of Boyle's law of gases. As you raise the temperature of a liquid in which a gas is, is uh, uh, mixed, more of that gas will come out. That's why when you open a can of Coke that's really, really cold, you don't get a lot of fizz, but if it's really warm, you get a lot more fizz, right? It's not, not rocket science, my friends. Third, plants love CO2. For every doubling of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, you get an average 35% increase in plant growth efficiency. They grow better in wetter and drier soil and, make better, and, and in cooler and warmer temperatures. That means they expand their ranges. They make better use of soil nutrients. Again, they expand their ranges, which means that all the, the, all the critters that depend on these plants get to expand their ranges too. So if you're worried about the sixth great extin extinction, which by the way is another myth, but if you're worried about that, you should really want to see more CO2 in the atmosphere to increase the ranges of plants, to increase the ranges of all the critters that depend on the plants, right? Furthermore, plants increase their fruit to fiber ratio and they resist diseases and pests better. 
The result is increased crop yields, which makes food less expensive and more available for everything that eats plants or eats something that does eat plants, right? So this is, this is just wonderful stuff. Carbon dioxide is the elixir of life, as many different people have put it. Before the Industrial Revolution, atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide was dangerously low at about 280 parts per million. It was about the lowest it had ever been in geologic history. Photosynthesis stops at 170 parts per million. If we had hit that, all life would have ended on Earth. We should be grateful that because of the Industrial Revolution and our use of fossil fuels, we turned that decline around and we now have far more CO2 in the atmosphere. One friend of mine, Dr. Craig Idso of the Center for the Study of, uh, of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change, did a review article that was published, I think, in 2013, uh, reviewing the findings of hundreds of studies of the impact of carbon dioxide concentration on plant growth and crop yield. And he concluded that from 1960 to 2012, simply our addition of CO2 to the atmosphere had increased global crop yield to the tune of $3.2 trillion worth. And if you then projected to the year 2050, based on the IPCC's predictions of how much more CO2 we would put into the atmosphere, you would add another $9.6 trillion worth of food to the global crop yield. This is good news. CO2 is our friend, not our foe. In fact, NASA satellite imagery, imagery tells us that our additions of CO2 have added immensely to leaf cover all over the world. This is good news, not bad. Um, so carbon dioxide is greening the future. I've got a couple of graphs there for you. But let's go back to the beginning here, to the foundation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. I ask you again, is catastrophic warming from, from increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration from 28 thousandths of 1%, that's 280 parts per million, to 40, uh, 42 thousandths of 1% uh, and to 40, 56 thousandths of 1% when we reach a full doubling around the year 2080, is, is catastrophic warming from that consistent with the fact that everything God made is very good? I don't think so. And I hope by now you don't think so either. Well, what can you do about these things? Well, you can tell local, state, and federal political candidates, I won't vote for you if you plan to fight global warming. I want abundant, affordable, reliable energy from fossil fuels and nuclear, not scarce, expensive, intermittent energy from wind and solar. And I want economic liberty and national sovereignty, not global governance and socialism. You can visit our, book ta our, our, our bookstore online, cornwallalliance.org slash shop. Uh, you can bring a speaker to, to, uh, from Cornwall Alliance to your church or other uh, uh, school or other things. You can read hundreds of articles and studies at our website, cornwallalliance.org. You can subscribe to our Cornwall Alliance email updates and listen to our Created to Rain podcast that Dr. Legates and I do. And you can also join a new, uh, a new program that we've got going called Allies in Action uh, to get resources to engage your neighbors, friends, and fellow church members. You can read about that at cornwallalliance.org. So I appreciate your attention today, and I would ask you to pray for not just the Cornwall Alliance, but especially, of course, for Truth Exchange and every other ministry that is seeking to unveil, to expose the anti-God and anti-human aspects of the current culture uh, that should not be any surprise that people attack humanity because they can't attack God. Satan can't attack God 
he being infinite and Satan being finite. So he attacks God's image instead, man, man and woman. Thank you very much. <laughs>